topic of temptation, and because we generally make excuses when we fall into temptation, I thought it might be interesting to share some real-life excuses. These were excuses provided to the Metropolitan Insurance Company, excuses that people actually wrote down due to their auto accident. So they had a car accident. These are the excuses they gave. An invisible car came out of nowhere, struck my car, and vanished. I, always, I hate when that happens. Those invisible cars, you need to watch out for them. The other car collided with mine without warning me of its intention. I didn't know cars had intentions. I had been driving my car for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had the accident. Well, you drive for 40 years straight and you probably will fall asleep. As I reached an intersection, a hedge sprang up, obscuring my vision. Blame it on the hedge. I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law, and headed over the embarkment. <laughs> Don't look at your mother-in-law while you're driving. The pedestrian had no idea which direction to go, so I ran over him. The telephone pole was approaching fast. I attempted to swerve out of its path when it struck my front end. The guy was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. <laughs> and then the last, the indirect cause of this accident was a little guy in a small car with a big mouth. <laughs> we, we all have excuses. But I hope you'll learn today by the end of this message, there's really no excuse you can give when you fall into temptation. God always makes a way of escape. There's always a door to walk through. You do not have to give in to temptation. So with that said, I want you to take your Bible and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'd like to read verses 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians 10 is a great passage on the subject of temptation. And it helps us to know that God is always faithful. He's always faithful. No matter how hard you're being tempted, you can trust in the faithfulness of God. I'm going to read just two verses. We'll refer to some other verses later in the message. But in verse 12, we have a warning. In verse 13, we have a word of assurance. And so often God does this. He warns us, but he also assures us. It says in verse 12, Therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. There's probably no more relevant message that I could share today than on the topic of temptation. And the reason is, as I'll say here in my first point, we all face temptation. Every one of us. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. I don't care if you've been a Christian a couple of days or if you've been a Christian a couple of decades. We all face temptation. If you notice here in verse 13, Paul says that temptations are common to man. They're common to man. To be human is to be tempted. And you can never become so holy in this life, and you might as well just put it out of your mind, you can never become so holy in this life that you exempt yourself from temptation. And you should not consider yourself a bad Christian just because you are being tempted. Listen, we all face temptation. That, that is just our lot in life. Now, if you don't think that you face temptation, or you don't think that you are temptable, you are actually more readily given in to temptation. I mean, think about the Apostle Peter. You remember what Jesus said to him? He said, before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you know me. Peter said, no, Lord, I will never do that. These other disciples may deny you, other people may deny you, but you can count on me, Lord. I am even willing to die with you, Lord. What did he do? He denied Christ three times. 
And when the Lord said to him, watch and pray that you fall not into temptation. Was he praying? No. He was fast asleep because he didn't think he would be tempted. He didn't think he would fall. And therefore, he was an easy target for Satan. And so if you're here today and you think, oh, I'm not tempted that often and I could never give in to sin, you are a target of the devil because all of us face temptation. Now, there are many different temptations. And I think our temptations change as we go through life. If you notice here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 7 through 10, I'm not going to read these verses, but he mentions four different temptations. He mentions idolatry, sexual immorality, testing Christ or testing the Lord, and complaining. Four different temptations, four different sins. Now, you may be here today and you're a young person. And therefore, your, your specific temptation may be in the area of immorality. You may be tempted to commit sexual immorality, to live with someone before marriage, or to engage in fornication. Or maybe you're starting out in your career, and you're thinking about money, and you're thinking about uh, climbing up the corporate ladder, and therefore, your specific temptation may be idolatry. You say, how can that be idolatry? Well, any time we put anything before God, that's an idol. Our money, our career, our family, anything that we put before God becomes an idol in our lives. And so you may be here today and you're a young person and maybe immorality is the temptation or idolatry. But as you go through life, your temptations change. As you get older, maybe you're here today and you're an older person and maybe immorality is not your big temptation, but maybe it's complaining and what I find interesting in this passage, he mentions four sins. He mentions idolatry, he mentions immorality, he mentions testing Christ, and he mentions complaining. He puts them in the same category. Do you realize that complaining is a big sin just as idolatry is a big sin and immorality is a big sin? And testing Christ is a big sin. You say, well, complaining is not a big sin. Yes, it is. Because if you believe in the sovereignty of God, when you're complaining, you're not really complaining against this person or that person. You're complaining against Almighty God. And God says, I know what I'm doing. And the funny thing is, when it comes to complaining, two areas where Christians often complain, and we shouldn't. One is in the church and one is in our family. You know, you think about the church, it's so easy to complain at church, especially in a growing church, because let me tell you, in a growing church, there is always change, always change. You can't freeze a church. If you freeze a church, you've just killed the church. And so in a church that's growing, there's always change. And so we need to, instead of resisting change, we need to celebrate change, because I can tell you one thing that will never, ever change in this church and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will always preach the gospel. We will always preach salvation through the blood. We will always preach the word of God. But other things at times will change. But that's not a bad thing. Sometimes that's a good thing. But also in our families. You know, it's so easy to complain with our families. Why is that? Our families are the most precious people, and yet we tend to complain. I came across a story the other day. It's in a book by... Ed Young Sr., The Ten Commandments of Marriage. I recommend this book. He says, during a group session, a counselor asked three men, what would you do if you knew you only had four weeks to live? What are you going to do? You only had four weeks. That's easy, the first man answered. I'd go to Las Vegas and have a good time spending all my money. You can't take it with you, so I might as well live it up before I go. Well, the second guy, the group's humanitarian, he said, I'd go out and serve my fellow man any way I could. I would minister to people and try to make their lives better. The counselor turned to the third man and waited for his response. Without hesitation, the man answered, I would move in with my mother-in-law, and I would stay with her every minute of every day for the whole four weeks. Well, that's a little odd, the counselor replied. Why would you do that when there are more enjoyable and productive ways to spend the last weeks of your life? Because, the man answered, those would be the four longest weeks of my life. 
Now, I hope my mother-in-law is not listening today on live stream. But Sherry, if you are, these stories do not pertain to you. I love you. But complaining, we, we have such a temptation to complain. We all face temptation. It's just a reality in life. Well, the second thing I want to share about this passage, and that is temptation itself is not a sin. It's not a sin. Paul distinguishes here between temptation and escaping from temptation. So you're tempted, and then there's a way of escape. God always makes a way of escape. So being tempted is not sinful in and of itself. It's only when you yield to temptation. Look over to, at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. This is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Right there it shows you. Jesus was without sin. Jesus never committed a transgression and yet he was tempted. And so that shows you that temptation is not the same as sin. We can be tempted without giving in to sin. Martin Luther once said, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. And so you think about the temptations, and I believe even thoughts. E. Stanley Jones says there's a difference between a thought of evil and an evil thought. And so there are thoughts of evil that go through our minds at times. There has to be. How could you be tempted if there was not a thought of evil that went through your mind? And so we have thoughts of evil that go through our mind, but they only become an evil thought when we cling to them, when we cherish them, when we fantasize about them, and when we eventually act them out. That's when the thought of evil becomes an evil thought. We all are tempted. Temptation is not the same as sin. But here's where the devil tricks us. You're undergoing temptation. You're feeling the pressure. You even kind of desire to give in to the temptation, but you haven't. You're resisting. You're saying no. And the devil whispers in your ear and says, hey, you, you've already given in. Uh, you're already committing sin. Even to desire this is sin. Even to contemplate this is sin. And so you've already given in. You might as well go and do it. Because the devil wants you to think that temptation and sin are one and the same thing. They're not. You may be overwhelmed by the temptation. Everything within you may want to give in to the, to the temptation. But if you stand your ground and you take up the shield of faith and you say no to the devil and you say, get behind me, Satan, you are righteous and holy in God's sight. You haven't done a thing wrong. And yet the devil will say, just because you're tempted, you've already committed sin, therefore you should go ahead and do it. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Temptation and sin, they're not the same thing. Well, the third thing we see in this passage, and that is we can overcome temptation with God's help. No matter how strong the temptation is, no matter how persistent the temptation is, we can overcome it, not in our strength, but with the strength of the Lord. I like what it says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You say, I've given into that temptation a hundred times. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You say, you don't, you don't understand how easy it is for me to do that. I cannot resist the devil in this area. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can, not in your strength, but in the strength and help of the Lord. Let me give you a couple of tips on how to overcome temptation. I think one is simply flee from sin. Just run from it. You know, if you read on down into verse 14 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Did you see that in verse 14? Flee from idolatry. If you skip back to chapter 6, verse 18 of 1 Corinthians, it says, flee from sexual immorality. Chapter 10, verse 14, flee from idolatry. Chapter 6, verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. Don't flirt with sin, flee from sin. Don't flirt with temptation, flee from temptation. And sometimes, you know, we just want to get so close. Okay, I don't want to give in, but I just want to, I want to feel the temptation. I just want to experience the temptation. I'm not going to give in. 
don't play that dangerous game. Don't see how close you can come without falling off the edge. The Bible says flee. Flee from sin. Listen, if you were in a building and it was on fire, you would flee. If you were in a sand pit and you noticed a rattlesnake, you would flee. If you were in an open field and you saw a tornado coming your way, you would flee. If you were out on a farm and a raging bull was heading your direction, you would flee. Sin is deadly. Sin is deceptive. Sin is dangerous. It is nothing to toy around with. Flee from sin. I like what, what Joseph did. You remember him over in Genesis chapter 39? Joseph was a handsome young man. Joseph was faithful to God. Joseph had great administrative abilities, and he was overseeing Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife, she became enamored with Joseph, and she fantasized about Joseph, and she desired Joseph. And Day after day, she attempted to seduce him, and he resisted, and he resisted, and one day she grabbed a hold of him, and the Bible says he ran for his life, even left his cloak behind. He ran for his life. Listen, that's how we need to approach sin. Not flirting with sin. Not toying with sin. Not seeing how close we could come to sin without giving in. Flee from sexual immorality. Flee from idolatry. What did Jesus say? If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Now, we know he was speaking metaphorically. You say, how do you know? Well, a one-eyed man can still lust, okay? And a one-armed man can still commit sin. So it's not saying literally take out your eye, literally cut off your arm. It's saying do whatever it takes to overcome sin. Do whatever it takes. Flee. Run. Go in the opposite direction because sin is deadly, sin is dangerous, sin is deceptive, and God is faithful. Flee from sin. I'll tell you another thing to keep in mind as you're seeking to overcome temptation. Consider the consequences. Consider the consequences of sin. And let me tell you, there are consequences. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. It says, we must, not, we, we must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. The judgment of God. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Nor grumble or complain as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Why is Paul referring to these Old Testament passages? You know why? He's saying they committed sin and there were consequences. They committed sin and there were consequences. Look over at uh, Galatians chapter 6 verses 7 and 8. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. You know what's deceptive about this? Here's what's deceptive. We know that whatever a man sows, he will reap. Here's the deceptive thing. We always reap later. You could go out today and you could plant a corn seed in the ground and then you could go the, the next day and say, oh, there's no corn. You could go a week later and say, there's no corn. Oh, there's no consequences. And so, you know, you, you go out one night and you commit fornication and you do things and you say, well, I woke up, I'm, I'm not pregnant, I woke up, I'm not in jail. And you think there are no consequences. They always come later. They always come later. Think about drinking a milkshake. Wouldn't it be great to have a milkshake right now to be able to drink one? Oh, hey. Hey, Brandon. Thank you, buddy. Steak and shake. Wow, it's chocolate. That's delicious. You know what I could do today? I could drink five of these today. I could. That's delicious. 
I could drink five of these today and I could get on the scales and I probably wouldn't have gained any weight. But give it a few days. When you're in your 40s, when you're in your 50s, give it a few days. Go out today and get the Big Mac supersized deal. Get the fries. Get the large Coke. Get the milkshake. Man, just do it up big. Yeah, get on the scales tonight. You, you, weigh, you weigh the same. Give it a few days. Give it a few days. Boy, I hate to give that up. Uh, keep an eye on her during the service. Make sure she doesn't drink all of that. There are consequences. There's always consequences. But they come later. That's the deceptive thing. I know sometimes they come immediately, but typically they come later. So you go out, you do wrong, you lie, whatever the sin is. And then you get up the next day, you say, well, I don't feel that different. I didn't get arrested by the law, and God didn't judge me and, and send me to hell. Maybe, this, maybe there aren't any consequences. You reap what you sow. You cannot break this law without this law breaking you. You reap what you sow. E. Stanley Jones once said, you're free to choose. And every one of you today, you're free to choose. You can go out today, do whatever you want. You're free to choose, but listen what you're not free to do. You're not free to choose the consequences of your choices. You're free to choose, but you're not free to choose the consequences of your choices. So go out today, do whatever you want, but once you do, you've started something. You reap what you sow. And you know what helps me when I'm facing temptation? I consider the consequences. If I do this, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to my ministry? What's going to happen to my relationship with God? I, I, I want to take the long look. Satan wants you to take the immediate look. Take the long look. Consider the consequences of sin. When I lived in Middletown back in the 90s, I had a neighbor, and he was a young man. He had two Alaskan Huskies. And he said, I want you to come over to my house today. I want to show you something. One was older, probably five, six, seven years of age, and the other was a pup. They were adorable, beautiful dogs, had the big, bright, crystal blue eyes. And he, and he had both dogs sit right in front of him. They were looking right at him. And he had a big piece of meat. I mean, it was like a ribeye steak. And he said, no. And he put that steak right on the ground. That older dog never one time looked at that steak. That older dog looked his master right in the eyes. He would not move. The younger dog, he'd look at his master. He'd look at the steak. He'd look at the master. He looked at the steak. He kept saying, no, no. He looked at the master. Ah! He grabbed the steak. And he ate it. He said, you see the difference? I said, I just got the point. And I said, there's more than dogs that you're telling me about right here. This is a spiritual lesson. When you're tempted, you have to keep your eyes on Jesus, on the master. Don't look at the temptation. Don't look at how appealing it is. Don't look at how desirable it is. Don't look at how obtainable it is. Take your eyes off of the temptation and look at how beautiful Jesus is. Look at how glorious Jesus is. And if you will keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, you will not give into that temptation. That dog, that Alaskan husky, everything in its nature wanted to eat that steak. And so it would not look at the steak. The older one only looked at the master. And when you're going through temptation, you have to keep your eyes on Jesus. And let me tell you, that helps you. Do you love sin or do you love Jesus more? And when you love Jesus, you say, yeah, I know it's appealing. I know it would satisfy my flesh. I know it would make me feel good for a little while. But Jesus, I love you more. I love you more than that. I deny myself for Jesus' sake. You've got to keep your eyes on the Lord. Consider the consequences of sin. Flee from sin, but also consider the consequences. 
But let me just say to you, we can overcome temptation. We can overcome it. Not in our strength, but in God's strength. And what you need to remember, found right there in verse 13, God is faithful. God is faithful. And you may be going through that temptation and everything within you may want to give in and you say, God, you are faithful. God, you are faithful. I know that you'll give me the strength. I know that you'll give me the way of escape. You know, I was set free from drug addiction and alcohol abuse when I was a teenager. I fell into that trap and, you know, I did what I shouldn't have done. I drank some alcohol one night and I smoked some marijuana one night and it made me feel good. It gave me confidence. It got my mind off things. It gave me a buzz. It, 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 friends accepted me in a way maybe they hadn't accepted me before. Woke up the next morning and thought, you know, I think I'm going to do that again. And I began to drink. And I began to smoke marijuana. And then I began to use cocaine. And then I began to hit acid occasionally. And I began to take Valiums and Xanaxes and do all of them together. And I was on a collision course with destruction. And I lived for drug abuse. I had an older friend who kind of took me under his wing and, and would, you know, introduce me to people who sold drugs. And he said to me, and it, at that time it made so much sense. It's so wrong but he said, now, Mark, you get an allowance? I said, yeah. He said, now, when you get that allowance, you can go out and go to McDonald's or you can go and play putt-putt golf or you can use it for drugs and enjoy the whole week smoking pot. And it made a lot of sense to me. I said, yeah, you're right. I started putting all my money towards drugs. Eventually, by the grace of God, Jesus came into my life, set me free, set me free, converted me, and it was a glorious day. I didn't think I would ever be able to lose the desire and the fascination. When you're out there, you become so fascinated with drugs and alcohol. And, and instantaneously, the Lord delivered me. But you know, after I was delivered, I've never had a desire to use drugs or alcohol since then. But after I had, de had been delivered a few weeks or months later, I, this fear began to creep into my mind. And I, I know now it was the devil that put it there. This fear, would, it would just go through my mind. Yeah, you're doing fine now, but give it a while. Yeah, I know you haven't smoked pot in two months. I know you haven't drunk alcohol in two months, but you won't, you won't endure. You won't stay faithful. It's only a matter of time that you're going to use again. And that fear began to hit me and... I began to think, will I, will I remain faithful? Am I going to go back to drug abuse? And one night I was reading in the book of Proverbs. And I know all the Bible is for us. But there are sometimes God gives you a verse just for a particular situation. You know, you're reading it. Lord, I know this is you. And I was reading Proverbs 3, 23 through 26. And as I read this, God just set me free from that fear. It says, then you will go on your way in safety. And your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have no fear of sudden disaster, of the ruin that overtakes the wicked. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being snared. When I read that, I knew right then God was speaking to me. And he said, Mark, you don't have to fear. I haven't just saved you for a week. I haven't just saved you for a couple of months. I've saved you for all eternity. And you never, ever have to go back to that lifestyle again. And I've been saved now for so many years. And God is faithful. God is faithful. God has all power. And you may have grandchildren today and great-grandchildren. They're on drugs. They're on alcohol. And other temptations have grabbed a hold of them. And the devil says, well, don't pray. It's not going to make any difference God is faithful. God can save. God can deliver. God can set free. And he can save you. He can save you. I don't care what the temptation is. It may have nothing to do with drugs or alcohol. All of our temptations are different. God can set you free. God can set you free. I want you to stand with me this morning. We're going to have a time of prayer. I'm going to ask Tim and Robin...
Tim and Rob, Rhonda, if they would, to stand over there. And Jenny and I will be over at this altar. If you want to come and pray, and if you'd like to pray alone, just go right to the altar, kneel, and we will let you pray and, and ask other people to let you pray in private. But if you want someone to pray with you today, you have a temptation, and, and maybe, maybe it has nothing to do with temptation, but you just need prayer this morning. Maybe you have a loved one that needs to be saved. Let's seek God in a time of prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we can overcome temptation. And Father, it gets me a little bit emotional to, to think of how you set me free. And Lord, I remember that fear that was in my mind and I thought I, maybe I would go back. If, but Lord, you showed me I don't ever have to go back. I'm saved and I'm secure in Jesus Christ that he has delivered me. And I just pray right now, if any have, has that fear or maybe they have a temptation or they have a, a child or a grandchild they want to pray about, pray for them. We're going to trust God for victory in their lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.